All right, on this adventure, we are going to discuss subrings. So suppose you have a ring R, and let S be a subset of R. Suppose S is closed under addition and multiplication. In other words, for any two elements in S, their sum is in S and their product is also in S. Then we say S is a subring if it is also a ring with respect to addition and multiplication. You might remember that was similar to our definition of subgroup. You had a subset of a group, the subset was closed under multiplication, then it was called a subgroup if it satisfied all the group axioms. Of course, it turned out there was an easier way to show something was a subgroup called the subgroup criterion. In much the same way, an equivalent definition of subring is the subring criterion. So a subring, S is a subring, if and only if it satisfies these three conditions. In other words, you don't need to check distributivity, associativity, and all those ring axioms for S. You just need to check these three things. Namely, that S is not empty. Two, that it's closed under multiplication, which was one of the things we needed before anyways. And three, that it's closed under subtraction. So not addition, but subtraction. You might remember the one of the versions of the subgroup criterion combined looked like this one. It had the first one, you just had to have a non-empty subset, and you had to have for any two elements R S inverse was an H. But of course, here the group operation is addition, so R S inverse becomes R minus S. Before we prove the subgroup criterion, let's look at some examples of, I mean, subring criterion. Let's look at some examples of subrings. Let n be a positive integer, then the multiples of n is a subring of z. So let's prove this using the subring criterion. That means we have to check these three conditions. First, that the set you're looking at is in fact non empty. Well, n is a multiple of n, so there is actually something in this set. Two, that for any two elements, there are differences in s. Oh, note I often mix up two and three. So it doesn't quite matter if you get them out of order. It just matters that all three are here. So I'm going to check subtraction first. So let r and s be multiples of n. I want to check that r minus s is also a multiple of n. Well, what does it mean to be a multiple of n? Well, that means r is equal to q times n. s is equal to q prime times n for some q and q prime that are definitely integers. Note these are different variable names because we started with different variables. Then what is r minus s? Well, we can substitute for r with qn, we can substitute for s with q prime n, factor out the common factor of n, and look, we have a multiple integer multiple of n. So r minus s is an nz. These two facts together tells us nz is an additive subgroup of z, which we already knew from before anyhow. So we just need to check the other property. Let r and s be multiples of n then this means r and s are of the form qn and q prime n for q and q prime and z. Let's multiply them together. Well, let's substitute s with q prime n, apply associativity, and we see that r times s is r times q prime times n, which is a multiple of n. Therefore, nz is a subring of z. So we've proven this result. And there are two things to note from doing this first proof. First, these two um, proofs end up taking pairs of elements. So it seems like one way to shorten your workload would be to move these two steps up here and to take a pair of elements and then just show r minus s and r times s are in your subring at the same time. Another interesting fact is we didn't actually use r equals qn here, which is kind of interesting. 
and we'll see what that means about this subring in a later lecture video. But I'm just highlighting it for now because it is usually interesting when you have a hypothesis that you didn't actually end up using. Now let's look at our a second example of a subring. This one actually is in the book. S is the upper triangular matrix two by two matrices. Claim S is a subring of M2R. Again, we're going to use the subring criterion. So first, let's show it's not empty. Well, the zero matrix is in this set. So it's definitely not empty. All right. Now we need to check closure under subtraction and multiplication. Here I'm going to use the trick I had observed from the previous proof, which is that it makes more sense to just pick two elements and then show the difference in product of those two or both in S, so that you only have to do make, write this sentence down once. So let X be an S, which means X is of this form. Let Y be an S, Y is of this form. Note if this were a complete proof, I would actually need to point out that A, B, C, A prime, B prime, and C prime are in fact real numbers. Because it's a video, I can just state that out loud, which is what I just did. So these are two matrices in S. All right, let's see what happens when you subtract. Well, how do you compute the difference of matrices? It's entry-wise subtraction. Zero minus zero is zero, and look, it's upper triangular again. So x minus 1 is an s. Similarly, what is x times y? Well, row times column, a, a prime plus b times 0 is a, a prime. Similarly, in this lower right corner, you get 0 times b prime plus c times c prime. So that's c times c prime. In the lower left corner, you get 0 c times a prime 0. That just becomes 0. So you can check that x times y is upper triangular. So it's also an s. Therefore, s is in fact a subring. And if you go back to older videos, you will remember um, if you look only with respect to multiplication and you look at the uh, matrices in here of non-zero determinant, we actually did this example before as a subgroup of GL2. And for fun, let's do a third example. So it's come to do the Gaussian integers, but since I'd like to save that one as a, or something similar as a homework problem, I thought I'd do what are called the Eisenstein integers. So these are the cubed roots of unity, or they come from the cubed roots of unity in the complex plane. Uh, you might recognize these as standard angles for, uh, or trig functions of standard angles. That is in fact true. That's how you calculate these values. This is omega right here, and this is omega squared. And so um, the Eisenstein integers are anything in the form a plus b times omega, where a and b are integers. And so you're taking integer multiple combinations of these three points in the complex plane. And the claim is that this is in fact a subring of C. Well certainly it's not empty because it contains at least these three points. At least it contains this point. Let's uh, let x and y be in z omega. Then x is equal to a plus b omega and y is equal to c plus d omega. It's not too hard to collect like terms and see that x minus y can be written as a minus c plus b minus d times omega. So the difference of two numbers in this form can also be written in this form. Finally, let's do x times y. That one's a little less obvious. Take these two numbers, let's FOIL it first. Outer and inner both involve an omega term, so you can factor out the omega, and the last term is b d omega squared. So how do you get around that omega squared? Well, if omega cubed minus 1 is 0, factor out this omega minus 1, 
and you get omega squared plus omega plus one equals zero, which tells you that omega squared is equal to negative omega minus one. So you could replace omega squared with negative omega minus one, which means you get a negative BD times omega and a negative BD up front. And look, we discovered that x times y can be rewritten as another number of this form. And so we see that the Eisenstein integers actually are subring of c. For those who are wondering where this nonsense comes from, the Eisenstein integers originally arise from proving that there are no non-trivial solutions, integer solutions to the equation x cubed plus y cubed equals c cubed. If you try to study that algebraically, you're led to having to consider Eisenstein integers. All right, so there are three examples of subrings. Let's prove the subring criterion. Now, this proof isn't on an exam, so you can skip this part if you want to skip it, but we desire to know why it is true, so I'm going to give the proof anyhow. So here's the statement. It's an equivalence between two different definitions of subring. As far as I'm concerned, this is the one worth remembering. But let's take the original definition of subring. So this just means it's a subset of R that's closed under addition and multiplication and is a ring with respect to that addition and multiplication. Well, so. Suppose you have a subring. I want to claim that it satisfies these three properties. Zero is an S. Why? Because if S is a subring, then it's also a subgroup of R with respect to addition. And you remember that if you're a subgroup with respect to addition, then you have the same identity element. So you have at least the identity element in S. This ensures that S has to be non-empty. Also, by definition of subring, S has to be closed under multiplication. So these two conditions are automatically met. Finally, take R and S elements in our subring. Since S is a subgroup of R with respect to addition, we know S is closed under inverses. So negative S is also an S. And we're closed under addition. So R plus negative S is an S. That's equal to R minus S. So we get all three conditions. Note, we actually used very little of the subring definition. We only used closure under multiplication and the fact that it's a subgroup of R with respect to addition. And then the only properties we used of that is the equivalence of definitions of subgroup of R that that meant it was, had the same identity and was closed under inversion. The same is true of our proof the other direction. We're going to backpedal and use the proofs, the facts we established when we studied subgroups to get away with doing a lot of the work for us. So suppose S satisfies 1, 2, and 3. Now we want to show S has to be a subring. Well, if you look at just 1 and 3 together, that was the subgroup criterion for addition, addition instead of multiplication. So that tells you that S is a subgroup of R with respect to addition. So if you just pretend multiplication doesn't exist for a moment, these two things together already tell us that you have a subgroup, an additive subgroup. And we already proved earlier in the course that a subgroup of an abelian group is abelian. So we also know that S is an abelian group for addition. Congratulations, that's the first axiom for being a ring, that it's an abelian group with respect to addition. So we only need to check the other ring axioms. Let's take three elements in S. Then those three elements happen to also be in R. These are the other conditions you need to check, associativity of multiplication and the distributive laws. Notice these three equalities are all true because these are elements in R 
and R is a ring. So multiplication in S is actually associative and distributes over addition. So the same weird thing happens that happened when we proved the subgroup criterion. You're taking elements inside the subset, you're multiplying them together, sure you're actually in the subset, but the reality is, is that just because you live on a house inside of a larger city, you're also still a person inside, residing in the city. So these elements also live in the larger set, and in the larger set the equality is known to be true because the larger set is a ring. And so these statements are already true. Therefore, multiplication is associative and distributive. And so you satisfy all the axioms to be a ring. And so S is a subring of R.